Sometimes in your search for happiness, you ponder the meaning of your life. And what is the truth? You sift your memory for beginnings. The truth. You send your mind ahead for directions. Truth. But all you really know is now, and you are lost in the present. And what is the truth? Well, now, here's a man who wants to get right down to it. Kind of anxious to get to it, are you? Whatever. Welcome back to the History of Being Human podcast, the only podcast that guarantees to cure you of being lost in the present. I'm the host, Noel Armstrong. Thank you for listening. Feel free to contact me at thobhpodcast at gmail.com. Certain names have had the ability to elicit everything from unease to mild chills going down your back to dark dread. What do you think about when you hear names like Rasputin, Herod? Genghis, Jezebel, Nero, and so on. Rightly or wrongly, they evoke a pretty strong negative association. You just don't see a lot of mothers naming their children things like Attila or Salome or little baby Caligula. Well, today we're going to be talking about one of the other odious names from history, that of Torquemada, a name that is synonymous with a certain form of sadism, and arguably the worst form of sadism, which is pious sadism that self-righteously cruel, merciless, severe schadenfreude. During his lifetime, people considered him the savior of Spain, the hammer of heretics, and yet his posthumous reputation is so bad that he became the foil in a Dostoevsky novel, a ghoul in a Edgar Allan Poe short story, the villain in Assassin's Creed, and a name that will forever be associated with bigotry, intolerance, ruthless persecution of helpless victims, Confessions extracted under torture, and pyres lit with burning heretics. That's the reputation, that's the legacy of Tomas de Torquemada. Torquemada was the first and greatest, meaning worst, Grand Inquisitor of Spain during the Spanish Inquisition. In fact, it is to him that we owe much of what the Spanish Inquisition was and came to be. If you loved Inspector Javert from Les Mis, but you thought he was a little bit too lenient, a little bit too merciful and forgiving, you will love Tomas de Torquemada. He did not have any of those character weaknesses. What's not to love and admire about a guy like that? In fact, he was so beloved by the Spanish people, especially the nobility, that by the end of his career, he had to travel with 50 bodyguards, 50 armed men, to prevent him from getting lynched. You'd think this would be cause for, if not self-doubt, at least a little self-reflection, but not Torquemada. None of his ilk, people like him throughout all history, never doubt the justice of their mission. They live their entire lives and go to their graves in the smug satisfaction that they'd done the right thing. They were right the whole time. And that was certainly the case with Torquemada. So that's who we're going to be learning about today. But before we talk about Torquemada, let's go back and set the stage in Spain of the 1400s. Because Torquemada truly was a man of his time. The man whose name is nearly synonymous with the Spanish Inquisition was born in the year 1420 in Valladolid, Spain. Valladolid is a town in the northwestern central portion of Spain. He was the son of a minor noble whose chief claim to fame was that he would stick his sword into various people in the countryside who were unfortunate enough to have insulted him. And as much as you would think Torquemada would look up to a father like that, he actually looked up more to his uncle, a famous theologian and cardinal, Juan de Torquemada. Torquemada. Yes, it seems he was drawn to the religious life from a very young age. This was a time of some religious conflict in Spain. Let's go back to the 8th century. In the 8th century, Moors invaded Spain. The Moors were a powerful group of nomadic people from North Africa who, on their way to establishing the Umayyad Caliphate, swept all the way through southern Spain, conquering all of it. The Umayyad Caliphate is a fascinating story in and of itself. If you talk about the great empires in the history of the world, you almost never mention the Umayyad Caliphate, and yet it was the seventh largest empire in the history of the world. That caliphate would continue to flourish in Spain and throughout Africa, Saudi Arabia, the entire region 
for 350 years. And not only was it vast and powerful, it was broad-minded, enlightened, and relatively literate, especially compared to the Christian societies of Europe at the time. So they weren't just building mosques and spreading Islam, they were also spreading a remarkable level of religious tolerance. Kind of a golden age for Spain. You had Christians in the north, Moors in the south, and of course a small Jewish population scattered throughout, and they were all living in acceptance and tolerance of each other's beliefs. And no, I'm not going to claim it was perfect, but it was workable. In fact, one of the most famous men in medieval Spain, the warlord known as El Cid, was a Christian who fought not only for Christian rulers, but also entered the service of Muslim rulers. So they would intermingle at a level that would be unheard of later on. By the 1200s, the Moors were losing a lot of territory to hostile Christian armies that came from the north of Spain. And soon Toledo, Cordoba began to surrender. The Moorish strongholds gave up one by one. And as the Spanish kingdoms became more and more Christian, less and less Muslim, they also became, I hate to say, less and less tolerant. And which group do you think suffered the most from this newfound religious intolerance? If you guessed the Jews, you were right. Laws targeting the Jews were enacted throughout several cities and towns around that time. In fact, when you hear about these persecutions, you realize that Hitler and the Third Reich just took a page out of the Spanish pogrom playbook. Because Jews at that time in Spain had to wear a special symbol identifying them as Jews. It was illegal for a Jew to hire a Christian. Jews were forbidden from performing various types of work. They couldn't be grocers or butchers, for example. And any Jew who chose not to show up at the Christian religious feast day, such as the feast day of Corpus Christi, had to pay a heavy fine. In many cases, the persecution and the oppression was severe enough that Jews simply found it easier to convert to Christianity. They became what were known as conversos. These converted ones were former Jews who converted to Christianity. Of course, Muslims did the same thing in many cases, found it easier to become Christians, and they too became conversos. At times, mobs of Christians, with, I'm sure, only the best of intentions, wanted to help the conversion process along. So, for example, in 1391, summer mobs rioted against wealthy Jews in the kingdom of Castile, dragged the Jews out of their homes, and forcibly baptized them as Christians. Those who tried to resist the mob violence, the forced conversions, were often killed. And like so much mob violence, it began to spread throughout the countryside. Seville, Cordoba, Valencia, Barcelona. Jews were forcibly converted and often killed if they refused. Now, as hard as it is to believe, some Christians began to distrust and feel some sense of unease about the true sincerity of the conversos, the Muslims and Jews and others who had been forced to convert to Christianity or sometimes baptized physically against their will. I don't know why they would doubt their sincerity in those conditions, but doubt they did. And with this doubt came rumors, rumors that the conversos were reverting to the religions they had practiced before they became Christians. So the converso Jews were once again practicing Judaism. The converso Muslims were going back to Islam. There were rumors of blasphemous ceremonies the conversos were performing to mock the Christian mass. And from time to time, the old blood libel would circulate again. And we'll talk more about that in a few moments. But let's go now to Torquemada himself. This is the milieu, the fetid swamp of bigotry and persecution into which Torquemada was born. He was born in 1420, and he entered the local San Pablo Dominican monastery at a very young age. At the time, the Dominicans had a reputation as the most zealous, not to say rabid, most zealous defenders of orthodoxy. In fact, among some people at the time, they were known as God's dogs, in a play on their name, Dominus, meaning master, one of the titles of God, and Canis, meaning dog. So the Dominicans were zealous, and Torquemada soon distinguished himself as a zealot's zealot which we have to admit is a dubious distinction, but Torquemada thrived on it. He was the most pious, the most austere, the most orthodox of the monks. So he rose through the ranks fairly quickly. And before he knew it, he was prior of the monastery of Santa Cruz at Segovia. And it was around that time and in that place that he met a young princess, Isabella I. And despite their differences in age and gender and relative rank, they recognized in each other kindred spirits. A similar fervor, a similar devotion to the pious Orthodox Catholic faith. And Isabella chose Torquemada to be her personal confessor, which meant her closest religious advisor. And so for years they enjoyed whatever doer relationship their temperaments would allow, I guess. Isabella's fortunes were about to rise. She would marry Ferdinand and become queen of all Spain 
and with her fortunes rising, so would Torquemada's. When Isabella took the throne in 1474, she offered Torquemada all sorts of grand ecclesiastical titles, all of which he refused. Say what you will about Torquemada, his austerity was not an affectation. And neither, for that matter, was his fanaticism. He was well known for his fanaticism from a very young age. Can you imagine joining this guy's monastery? He was the first Dominican prior to introduce the concept of limpieza sangre, or pure blood, into the Dominican house. He didn't want any Dominicans joining his order if they had even a drop of Jewish blood in their veins. And once again, I can't help but comment here. The superstition of blood, pure blood or blood of a certain type, has done more damage in this world than almost any other stupid idea in history. But you know, the beautifully ironic thing about this is, Torquemada was going to find out that he himself was a descendant of a converso. If the limpieza sangre, which he was pushing, had gone into effect, he would not have been able to join the Dominican order. This guy has an awful lot in common with Adolf Hitler when you look at his life story. Many people believe that the knowledge he had of his own converso, his own Jewish blood, as he would have called it, made him that much more intractable and frankly rabid in his persecution of Spain's Jewish population. And I will pause to relate just one more telling little vignette about the life of Torquemada. When he was still a novice monk, he led a book burning at his monastery in Salamanca. And from then on, whenever he found heretical books or books that he deemed unfit for Christians to read, he would hold a book burning, which now in hindsight probably seems just a little bit like a warm-up for the heretic burnings that he would preside over. It was all part of his relentless quest, his core disposition to seek purity. If you were raised in or part of a purity culture yourself, you get it. Censoring books or censoring people are just different steps driven by the same impulse. And that was a hallmark of Torquemada's life from beginning to end. Let's go back to our timeline. It was 1469 when Ferdinand and Isabella were married, and Torquemada was there. Five years later, Isabella herself was coronated queen, and Torquemada was again there. He remained her closest confidant, throughout her lifetime, throughout his lifetime anyway, she did outlive him. He also became Ferdinand's confessor at Isabella's request. This gave Torquemada tremendous power and influence. As the confessor, he should have only advised Ferdinand and Isabella in religious matters. But to Isabella, who called herself the Catholic monarch, everything was religious, even the governance of her kingdom. So Torquemada's influence went far beyond matters of personal piety. I picture him sort of like the Greemer worm tongue of the Spanish royalty. Not sure that's accurate. That's just the image it evokes. But going back to the big picture about what's going on in Spain around this time. The process of Christians retaking lands that had been previously lost to the Moors was called the Reconquista. Along with the Reconquista, in the late 1300s, early 1400s, came persecution of the Jews. Many Jews converted to save their lives. Many died a martyr's death, but others converted. Of course, the same thing was happening with the Muslims to a lesser extent. The fact is, there just weren't as many Muslim conversos as there were Jewish, and that's for a very good reason. The Muslim conversos were still subject to expulsion from Spain. So why would you convert trying to save yourself from being expelled from Spain when you're just going to be expelled anyway? The Jewish conversos were treated differently. They were allowed to return to their work. They could hire people, perform their old jobs, make money, become influential, even wealthy and powerful in some cases. But they were in a very strange place as they related to Catholic doctrine. Catholic doctrine held that if you were baptized against your will, you could return to your old religion. If it was a forced conversion, it was no conversion at all. But that meant, essentially, if you were physically unable to escape the priest as he was baptizing you, that was not a valid baptism. If you could escape the priest when he was baptizing you, then it was still considered voluntary. So if somebody threatened your life, if they had a gun to your head and said, unless you get baptized right now, you are going to be shot, they would still consider that a voluntary conversion. Of course, we would not consider it that today. But they did at the time. And what that meant was, those Jews could never go back to practicing Judaism. They were Catholics, and if they tried to revert, they were heretics, and they were subject at that point to the Inquisition. Some of the Jews thus converted seemed to be all in on Catholicism. 
Torque Mata's ancestors among them. They embraced Catholicism and made themselves into good Catholics. But as soon as the threat of life and limb was removed, many of these converso Jews reverted back to the religion that they actually believed in, which was Judaism. Now, they had to practice that in secret, though. So they were called crypto-Jews, or a very derogatory term given to them by the Spaniards was marranos. This was an extremely offensive and pejorative name because it meant swine, that most unclean animal in Jewish ritual law. Now, when Ferdinand and Isabella got married, when they assumed the throne and took control of most of Spain, they had a problem. They were uniting many different lands and many different peoples, some of which wholly embraced their reign and others did not. To unite the nobles, to unite all of Spain, Ferdinand and Isabella, rightly or wrongly, decided it was critical to unite all Christians in an Orthodox Catholic faith and to separate Christians from non-Christians. This became particularly sticky in the Jewish communities, where some of the Jews were, as we said, devout and fervent Catholics, and others continued to practice Judaism. What they figured they really needed to do was to root out the heretics and root out what they called the Maranos, the crypto-Jews. They needed to stop them from influencing those true Catholic converted Jews into adopting the old ways of Judaism. So what they needed, in other words, in short, was a good inquisition, ensuring orthodoxy and orthopraxy would vouchsafe their reign, would make them much more effective rulers of all Spain. And so in the blessed year of our Lord, 1478, Ferdinand and Isabella petitioned the Pope, Sixtus IV, to establish the Inquisition in Spain. Now, the first attempts at establishing the Inquisition were disorganized. They encountered a lot of resistance from the nobility especially. The nobility considered it an encroachment on their rights and their leadership in their own territories to have inquisitors coming and enforcing an outside law. So four years later, Ferdinand and Isabella tried again. They petitioned the Pope to intervene to establish six tribunals throughout Spain. And in February of 1482, the Pope agreed. And of course, it wouldn't make sense to have these six tribunals, these six offices of the Inquisition, without someone to run each of them. After all, what's an Inquisition without an Inquisitor? One of those chosen was, you guessed it. That's right, Torquemada met the official requirements for the post. That is, the Inquisitor had to be over 40 years old, possess a flawless reputation, and be well-versed in theology. And as we already said, Torquemada's reputation as a book burner was already well-established, so he was perfect for the job. You remember I said that Isabella offered Torquemada many honorific titles, many high posts in the land. He turned all of those down. It turns out he was just waiting for his dream appointment, something far more suited to his temperament. That was violently purifying the land. And by purifying, we mean enforcing his utopian vision of an entire nation of people acting and thinking according to his Orthodox Catholic beliefs. And once organized and chartered in this way, the Inquisition was underway in earnest. The Inquisition in Spain launched what could rightly be called a reign of terror. People could be summoned from their homes, taken to a secret prison, with no idea where they were going. Usually they were rousted from their beds in the middle of the night, hooded, and taken somewhere where they had no idea where they were. Once they were imprisoned, they had no idea who their accusers were, who the judges were. They didn't know the testimony that was being used against them. Many of the denunciations, the accusations that led to some poor sap being imprisoned in this way were anonymous. They could come from criminals, thieves, people who normally wouldn't be allowed to bring an accusation in a court of law. It didn't matter to the Inquisition. All that was needed was the accusation. That would set the inquisitorial judges to work, and if they could back it up with the testimony of one or two other people, then they would roust you out of bed, drag you to prison, and begin putting you to the question. I realize that that brings up the topic of torture during the Inquisition, and I want to put that on the back burner for just a moment. Let's go back to Torquemada. 1483, Torquemada became the Grand Inquisitor of Castile. And October 17, 1483, Ferdinand himself appointed Torquemada as the chief inquisitor of Aragon. Torquemada convened a general assembly of all other inquisitors in 1484 in Seville and gave them an outline with 28 points to guide them in their inquiries. In these 28 articles, he casually mentions the confiscation of property and torture. 
What's most interesting about those articles is the hubris with which he extends the reach of the Inquisitors. Not only should they prosecute crimes of heresy and apostasy, but they should also zealously prosecute sodomy, polygamy, sorcery, and lending money for interest. As you read the records of the Inquisition, you can see people dragged before it for the heinous crimes of eating pork, skipping a feast, or claiming some special folk magic ability or incantation. As the head or grand inquisitor, Torquemada ran the entire thing. Nothing happened without his approval. And that included every sentence, from something so innocuous as a penance, to a prison term, to an audit of fate, to being burned at the stake. With the level of power and influence Torquemada wielded, and with the support of Ferdinand and Isabella, it was almost like he was a second pope. He controlled all of the bishops and priests in Spain, and in fact, went after some of them as heretics as well. And this might be why early on in the Inquisition, early on in Torquemada's reign, if you want to call it that, his reign of terror, people generally supported him. They got behind the idea of the Inquisition. But as it went on, and as people saw the carnage and the body counts rising, opposition grew and became very strong. We'll talk about that in a moment. But I've already alluded to the torture. One of the things that people objected to the most was the employment of torture. This wouldn't be the history of being human podcast if I didn't talk about the specific forms of torture employed by the Spanish Inquisition. These forms of torture had to meet one very important criteria, one very hypocritical criteria. That is, the church could not shed blood. So it had to be bloodless torture that they inflicted on their victims. That meant that usually it involved the rack, the strapado, or waterboarding. First, we'll talk about the rack. That was the most terrifying, the most damaging, the most gruesome form of torture. Not only did it inflict unimaginable, unbearable levels of pain on the victims, it often left them crippled for life, unable to sit up on their own power, let alone stand and walk. It could turn formerly healthy and strong people into disarticulated, floppy scarecrows. But don't worry, it never shed the blood of a victim. Most of you probably already know what a rack is. Some kind of rectangular device, usually a wooden frame raised from the ground with a roller at one or both ends. The victim's ankles were tied to one end and their wrists tied to the other. There was some kind of a ratchet mechanism at one end or the other. And so as you turn the wheels and click the ratchet, progressively increasing tension and stretching was applied to the victim's wrists and ankles. If the victim was lucky, they could get away with a dislocated shoulder or elbow or ankle. That could be reset and they could be restored to function to some extent. If they were unlucky, they would be stretched so far on the rack that their muscle fibers would be permanently damaged, never able to contract normally again. Joints could be not only dislocated, but permanently separated with all of their support structures permanently destroyed. Even if the inquisitors decided to impose a light sentence after extracting a confession from these people, they would never be the same again. At times, all that was needed to extract a confession from a victim was to allow them to watch someone else being stretched on the rack and to tell them they were next if they didn't confess because there were a whole host of gruesome sound effects that accompanied stretching on the rack. Popping, tearing, screams. And if you read the records, and make no mistake, inquisitors were sadistic psychopaths, but they kept meticulous records. If you read the records, they record every groan, every scream in many cases. Let's move on to a form of torture that was less permanently disabling, but just as effective, just as painful and severe. That is the strapado. The use of the strapado, or corda, as it was also called, had three variations. The accused would have their hands tied behind their back. So in that case, it was a little like having your hands handcuffed behind your back. But now imagine that if your hands were handcuffed behind your back, somebody tied a rope to those handcuffs, threw it over a beam, and began to hoist you into the air with your hands behind your back. It's hard actually to imagine the strain that would put on your elbows and your shoulders as you tried to keep them from dislocating. You would then be left hanging there until something dislocated or until you confessed. And if it wasn't proceeding quickly enough, what they would do is let the rope slip, let you fall five or six feet, and then jerk the rope. And in that way, they could almost guarantee that something would give, something would be dislocated, the pain would become unbearable, and you would beg to be allowed to confess. So that was the strapado or corda. And of course, there were many enhancements and innovations that made it even worse, which I won't go into. 
The third common form of torture used during the Inquisition was the toca, also known as waterboarding. And this is exactly the waterboarding you are thinking of. The poor victim would be strapped down to a board, their head immobilized, arms and legs immobilized. They couldn't thrash around because the idea was to convince the victim that they were drowning. So some form of cloth or rag would be shoved into the victim's mouth and water poured onto the rag to mimic the sensation of drowning. At first, they would start easily with the victim having enough time to draw breath between sessions of drowning. But as confessions became harder to extract, they would increase the amount and the time the water was poured onto the rag. Victims were reported to turn blue, their eyes bulge out of their heads, their chest heave, and they would lose consciousness. Death was actually a distinct possibility. People were forced to witness this torture also. And just the sight of it was so terrifying, so disturbing, that people would confess to avoid the same fate. And I will just say this, when the United States was employing waterboarding, there was some wrangling over what term to use. Was it enhanced interrogation or was it torture? Well, the Inquisitors had no such qualm and they didn't quibble with words. They knew that waterboarding, or toka, was a particularly heinous, terrifying, and painful form of torture. There were many other very creative, very sadistic forms of torture employed by Inquisitors, but these were the main three. And I'll spare you the details of any others, because I think that's enough, for one thing, and also because I think it suffices to give you an idea of the spirit of the thing, of what was happening to people under Torquemada's guidance. In their defense, I should say that Inquisitors were only allowed to torture a victim once. But that was pretty easy to circumvent. All you had to do is torture them several days in a row and claim it was all part of this same session of torture. Also, mutilation of the victim was forbidden and punishable. But Torquemada ensured that Inquisitors could clear each other of wrongdoing through a very simple process. And so the upshot of that was, as you can guess, almost no one was ever punished for killing or mutilating a victim during torture sessions. Of course, the goal of all of this was the holy task of extracting a confession. Only with a confession could the soul of the sinner be saved. Once they had confessed, though, their punishment was not over. In fact, the confession was a necessary step in dealing out a punishment. The punishment could be anything from forgiveness. They could be forgiven by the mercy of the church, or they could be forced to do certain penances like taking pilgrimages, donating money, wearing several heavy crosses, saying Hail Marys or other prayers. And a lot of the time you read the records of the Inquisition, you think, you know, that wasn't so bad. That was pretty merciful of these churchmen. They had these people in their power and they decided to forgive them or ask them to do something rather small. And I will even admit that that happened in a majority of the cases. Most of the time, the punishments weren't too severe. But there were plenty of times when people lost everything when their property was confiscated and never returned, or when they were given punishment such as life imprisonment. But the worst of all is when the inquisitors would wring their hands and sanctimoniously and piously say, we've done everything we can for you. You've left us no choice but to abandon you to the secular arm. And of course, all that meant was, we're going to let the king and his henchmen kill you so that we can pretend our hands are clean. We can wash our hands of your death. And once you were condemned to death, you got to participate in an auto de fe, an act of faith. Since the auto de fe is the apotheosis of the Inquisition, I want to go into it in some detail. But before I do that, I just want to point out how unfair these inquisitorial trials were, how loaded and stacked the deck was. In most cases, the prosecutor and the judge were the same person. The standard in modern criminal trials is a presumption of innocence, and it's up to the prosecution to prove the defendant guilty. Well, in the Inquisition, the opposite was the case. There was a presumption of guilt, and it was up to the poor victim to prove themselves innocent. Even if no outward crime could be demonstrated or proven, Torque Mata made it very clear that many of the people brought before the Inquisition were committing crimes in their heart, in their secret thoughts. Imagine that. Torque Mata said that outwardly, you might be the most devout of believers, but inwardly, you may be a brazen heretic. And it was up to the Inquisition to root those people out. So think about that. You're living a perfectly observant lifestyle. Maybe in your heart of hearts, you're a true believer, but somebody accuses you of heresy. You're tortured until you confess it, and then you have to do penance. I don't know how often that nightmare scenario obtained. It might have been relatively rare, 
but you can't tell me that it didn't happen hundreds or thousands of times. Especially when you consider two additional factors. That is, accusations could be made anonymously. And the second factor is, the state often got to confiscate and keep your property when you fell into the hands of the Inquisition. And maybe worst of all, your incarceration, your torture, the testimony, your entire trial was held in total secrecy. Most of the people in your family had no idea where you were, just that you had fallen into the hands of the Inquisition. Most of the victims had no idea where they were being held. And in fact, when the trial was concluded, if you were lucky enough to escape, you were sworn to secrecy, saying even one word about your experience before the Inquisition could land you in its power one more time. The entire process, frankly, is so offensive to our modern sense of justice that it's hard to fathom that it actually occurred, and especially hard to fathom that it was led by one who claimed to be a humble follower of the peaceful prophet from Galilee. You read the story of Torquemada's life, frankly, you realize he probably slept great at night. He didn't lose a moment's sleep over the over 2,000 people that died basically at his hands. So let's get back now to the auto de fe, the act of faith, the grand ceremony associated with the Inquisition, the spectacle of spectacles. So the entire trial, the torture, the testimony, all of that was conducted in total secrecy. But the auto de fe was a very public spectacle. The nobility and other public dignitaries were invited. Huge crowds would attend. They would take place in the public square or the courtyard of the biggest church. When you see films or artistic representations about an auto de fe, you usually see victims being tortured or burned at the stake right during the auto de fe. However, that wasn't actually officially part of the auto de fe. No victims were tortured after the trial was concluded, unless they were burned. Of course, that's a form of torture. And the auto de fe was separate from the public execution. Remember, the church wanted to distance itself from the act of killing, from the shedding of blood. And so the auto de fe proper itself generally consisted of the victims being harangued and preached to by someone or other or several eminent clerics. In fact, if you remember the Joan of Arc episode, she had to listen to sermons before she was burnt. And that's what happened in Spain and Portugal and everywhere the Inquisition went. The auto de fe itself consisted of preaching, and it was only after that preaching that the victims were relaxed, as they called it, or turned over to the secular arm, where they would be strangled, or strangled and burned, or worst of all, burned without being strangled first. The first auto de fe of the Spanish Inquisition occurred in 1481. Six of the men and women that participated in that auto de fe were burned at the stake later, executed later. And get this, the last auto de fe in Spain of the Spanish Inquisition occurred in Valencia in the year 1826. It's really difficult to get an idea for the exact number of people who were executed by the Spanish Inquisition. A lot of the previous numbers were grossly exaggerated. Ironically, it was often the inquisitors themselves who would over-report the number of victims of the Inquisition. I guess they wanted to make it look like they were busy. One historian of the Inquisition in the 19th century, a man named Jose Amador de los Rios, estimated that between the years 1484 and 1525, 28,540 people were burned. Almost 30,000 people burned by the Inquisition. Over 10 times that many, about 300,000, were penanced, as he called it, meaning they were tried by the Inquisition and given a lesser form of punishment. 16,000 plus, he said, were burned in effigy or dug up and burned. That was another beautiful feature of the Inquisition. Even if you were dead, you didn't escape the ravages of the Inquisition because they would dig up the corpses of suspected heretics and burn them. And if they couldn't find a good corpse to burn, they would just burn you in effigy. Now, I will say that it's fortunate that modern scholars have gone through all of the archival records that they can find, and they say the actual number is far lower. In fact, it's a tenth. Only 3,000 people were probably burned alive during the Spanish Inquisition. And so I guess the apologists for the Inquisition would say that's far, far better. But we have to wonder, how many people being burned alive is too many? I would submit that 3,000 is still far too many. In fact, it's 3,000 too many. Many of the auto de fe's were very orchestrated, thoroughly planned entertainment events. That's the only way you could describe them. I'm not exaggerating or being ironic when I tell you that towns competed, not officially of course, but they did compete to see who could have the best auto de fe. So an all-night vigil might be held. 
followed by a mass at breakfast, then a breakfast feast for everyone who came to attend the auto de fe. After this feast, there would be a procession, a ceremony of public penance. And some of this was Torquemada's touch, because this would consist of victims, people who had been convicted of heresy or other crimes, being paraded through the streets in what's called a San Benito, a penance garment, usually of yellow sackcloth, decorated with scenes of hellfire or demons or other fearsome apparitions. Now, I understand that this was anything but humorous to the victims, but the whole thing strikes me as so childish that, frankly, it's all the more ghoulish because of how childish it seems. So at the time that these victims were being marched around, their heads were covered. Nobody knew who they were as they marched around in their demon cloaks and hell hoods or whatever they called them, the San Benitos. Another Torquemada touch was to increase, to heighten the drama of the spectacle, Often the victims wouldn't even know what their sentence was going to be. They might find out at the exact same time as the entire crowd that they were condemned to be burned alive. So after feasting and a march and the sermons, the victims were taken outside the city walls to a place called the Quemadero, the burning place. It's interesting because Torquemada's name, the last part of it, Quemada, means burning. I'm not sure there's any significance whatsoever to that, but it does seem apropos. So the victims would be marched to the quemadero, to the burning place. There their hoods would be removed, and then in real time they would find out their sentence. The drama was heightened because you would see those who were acquitted fall to their knees in gratitude, while those who were condemned to be burned would often fall to their knees and beg to be forgiven, beg to be spared that punishment. Of those who were condemned to capital punishment, like I said, some of them were mercifully strangled before they were burned. But the worst sinners were burned while they were still alive. A horrible, torturous death after they'd already been subjected to torture. As I've already alluded to in the previous parts of this episode, many of those summoned before the Inquisition were conversos. For example, according to the records in Catalonia, 1,199 people were tried between 1488 and 1505. Of that 1,199, 1,191 of them were conversos. The sad fact was, whether it was his intention or not, in Torquemada's hands, the Inquisition was primarily an instrument for inflicting suffering on the Jewish population of Spain. That was its cash value. Because so many conversos were being burned and killed by the Inquisition, Torquemada and others thought it would just be more efficient to expel all of the Jews from Spain. Don't try them one by one. Just throw them all out. And in the year 1492, Ferdinand and Isabella agreed. So 1492 was kind of a mixed year for them. On the one hand, it was the year, as we celebrate in the West, that they commissioned Columbus to find a better route to the Indies. And he ended up, of course, finding the Americas. But it's also the year that they expelled Spain's entire Jewish population. Identifying as a Jew, practicing Judaism, became illegal in all of Spain in the year 1492. After this was decreed, a coalition of powerful Jewish families got together 30,000 ducats and offered it to Ferdinand and Isabella if they would rescind their expulsion decree. According to eyewitnesses, Ferdinand was actually thinking about accepting the money and allowing the Jews to remain in Spain. When Torquemada heard that Ferdinand was wavering, he marched into the quarters of Ferdinand with a cross. He laid the crucifix on the table before Ferdinand and said, quote, Judas Iscariot sold Christ for 30 pieces of silver. Your Highness is about to sell him for 30,000 ducats. Here he is. Take him and sell him. And with that, he left the crucifix on his table. And apparently Torquemada's little fit of pique. I don't even know if you'd call that an argument. What was that? Somehow it convinced Ferdinand. And he decided not to accept the money and to expel the Jews. 80,000 Jews were forced to leave Spain, to leave their homes, to leave their livelihood behind, to the great satisfaction of Torquemada. And one more thing I failed to mention about the year 1492, that was also the year that the last Moorish stronghold in Granada, the last place in Spain where the Moors had a stronghold, was seized by Spanish royal forces. Now you might think that after 1492, with all of the Jews expelled from Spain, all of the Moors expelled from Spain, that Torquemada and his diagnosable condition of scrupulosity could have rested on his laurels, could have ceased the Inquisition. But of course, if you think that, you don't know Torquemada. Torquemada continued in the role of Grand Inquisitor until his death six years later, 1498. But here's the good thing. Here's the somewhat mitigating factor. In 1494, ostensibly due to Torquemada's, quote, 
failing health, end quote, the Pope actually appointed four assistant inquisitors that took over many of the duties of Torquemada. Most historians believe that the Pope had gotten too many complaints about Torquemada's relentless cruelty, his excessive zealotry, and so to the Pope's credit, he knew he had a problem. He didn't want Torquemada in that position any longer. But he had another problem, that is, he had Ferdinand and Isabella, the powerful rulers of Spain, supporting Torquemada. So the best way that he could put Torquemada out to pasture was by installing these four assistant inquisitors that essentially took over almost all of Torquemada's duties. At that point, Torquemada became more of a figurehead over the Inquisition. And from 1494 on, Torquemada returned to the more hermetic monk's life, in fact occupying only a single cell in the monastery of St. Thomas Aquinas in Avila until the day of his death. 1494 to 1498, that's where Torquemada lived. He never lost faith in his mission. In fact, one of his last actions before his death was to convene a general assembly, still in his official role as the Grand Inquisitor of all Spain, to convene a general assembly to make sure that his beautiful baby, his brainchild, the Inquisition, would live on after he died. And with that dubious feat accomplished, Torquemada died in 1498. And he was wildly successful in prolonging the Spanish Inquisition. In fact, it went on for another 336 years. The Inquisition was not officially disbanded until 1834. It spread from the Iberian Peninsula to every territory controlled by Spain, including those in Central and South America. All told, historians are wildly divergent in their estimates about how many people actually died, and how many people were burned, how many people were tortured during what amounted to hundreds of years of Spanish Inquisition. And the good news is that the Inquisition itself has undergone somewhat of an apologist rehabilitation over the last several years. Used to be that the estimates were in the hundreds of thousands or even millions of people killed by the Inquisition. Most historians now would estimate that between three and 10,000 people were killed by the Spanish Inquisition, with many more tortured, many more detained, and hundreds of thousands more punished in some way or another. So now that we have concluded this brief review of Torquemada's life, let's talk about why he's such an odious figure. Let's talk about why he is infamous and of such bad repute. Well, first of all, he himself was from a family of conversos, and yet he saved most of his worst vitriol, some of his worst persecution and expulsion orders for the Jewish people. It was he more than anyone else who whispered in the ears of Ferdinand and Isabella that many conversos were turning to their Judaic rites, practicing crypto-Judaism, and needed to be rooted out. With this firm conviction, he set up a network of spies, secret police, encouraged people to rat each other out, and created and promoted, energetically promoted, by the way, a system under which thousands of Jews were dispossessed of all their inheritance, many were killed, thousands were tortured. And it was Torquemada in the end, in 1492, who made certain that Ferdinand and Isabella expelled all the Jews from Spain. That's 80,000 stable, peaceful, contributing members of society who are forced to leave everything behind, lose everything, face certain poverty, and often death. His intolerance and cruelty offended even people in an age of intolerance and cruelty. He was so unpopular, so loathed by the population because of his torture oppression, confiscation of properties, unjust accusations, and abuse of authority, that he had to travel around with 50 armed men, as I said before, to avoid being lynched himself. This was a wretched human being who was absolutely convinced he was serving the man from Galilee, as said, the peaceful man from Galilee. All of this Torquemada did in the name of Jesus. And really, when you think about it, maybe his greatest achievement was transforming Spanish society into something out of an Orwell novel into a 1984-like world, where everyone tattled on everyone else, where you lived in a state of almost constant paranoia, looking over your shoulder, where the state had absolute power. At least the inquisitional arm of the state had absolute power, and its victims had almost no rights and almost no power whatsoever. Where the immolation, the burning alive of helpless victims for the most idiotic of offenses was a public spectacle with almost a festive atmosphere. When you learn about the lives of these sadists, these people who bring so much misery and suffering to their fellow humans, you have to think one of the most infuriating things is that they never say they're sorry. They never even feel sorry. They're convinced they're doing the right thing. 
and they would do it all over again if they had the chance. And that was certainly Torquemada. Small wonder, then, that his legacy was so unjust, so infuriating, that in 1832, some ne'er-do-wells dug up the corpse, the bones of Torquemada, and burned them. 349 years after the Inquisition he helped found, 334 years after Torquemada's death, and two years before the Inquisition would be formally disbanded forever, the corpse of Torquemada faced its own auto de fe. And with that, we're going to conclude this episode of the History of Being Human podcast. I'm the host, Noel Armstrong. Again, thank you for listening as we try to resurrect sense and meaning from the dust of a billion factoids. Please take just one second, just take a moment. Give us a five-star review on iTunes or whatever podcatcher you listen to. Next time, we're going to move on from the Inquisition. We've had a lot of fun, but now it's time to say goodbye.